morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our session this morning on VAT matters in relation to Academy Trusts. I'm Bianca Silva, and our speaker this morning is Glyn Edwards, who's one of our VAT directors. Um, you probably can see on your screen um, a poll um, that we'd like you to complete if you can. Uh, it's just a, one question. Is your academy registered for VAT? So um, thank you for those who have entered um, their answers. At the moment, we've got 71% who are registered for VAT and 29% who are not. So Glyn, I'll now hand over to you to start your presentation. Thanks, Bianca. That's interesting. And I think that's, um, that's indicative of, of the future of, of, of academies as, as, as more and more academies are, are encouraged into larger mats. Um, I think we'll see more and more of you having to cope with VAT registration. Um, now, today's um, presentation will be aimed at both those who are unregistered and registered for VAT. But the, for those of you who are unregistered, please do um, continue to think about VAT registration as I'm speaking, because my guess is at some point you are going to join that, um, that happy club. Um, just for our introduction, so I'm, I'm Glenn. I joined... Um, MHA uh, just over five years ago um, and at that point had no experience in academies and the introduction to me to academies was quite um, an eye-opener because academies are so different in terms of their treatment of VAT from what I was used to um, that I've had to learn quite a lot. One of the difficult things about advising academies is that HMRC's guidance on VAT for academies is tiny absolutely tiny it runs to one page um, for all these different issues that we're going to talk about today one page and that hasn't been updated um, since I started looking at it so a lot of what we do we have to sort of learn on the go um, some of you all know and some of you will have heard parts of this presentation before particularly we joined last year so to some extent there'll be a, a refresher element but within what we'll speak about today are some new things, things that have cropped up with our clients um, this year, things that we've identified as specific risks. Um, so so I'll, I'll highlight those. So we're going to talk about a fundamental principle, the idea of business as opposed to non-business activities. What does that mean and why does it matter to academies? We'll be looking at why academies are sometimes obliged to register for VAT, as well as what happens with academies who are not obliged to register and how they deal with VAT. We'll look at how VAT recovery is calculated, both for registered and unregistered academies. And for registered academies, towards the end of today, uh, of our hour today, we'll be looking at um, specifics of partial exemption and, and capital goods scheme. Be familiar to some of you, not to others, so that will be a, a useful introduction. Anticipate that we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll finish within the hour and um, questions are really welcome because, and don't worry if you think they're simple because a lot of us will be new to this, um, so please, please ask away and it will, it will, it will make my job um, easier. So um, let's just talk about some general VAT concepts. So this is where I'd probably start off um, in my understanding of VAT before I came across academies. So for those of you who've worked in industry or an accountancy practice or something like that, this will probably be what you'd understand as being the norm for most, for most businesses. And that is that a business, maybe a charity, for example, with business activities, can recover VAT, but only in respect of its taxable business activities. So a charity, for example, which has a shop, makes sales which are liable to VAT, often at the zero rate, but then nevertheless vatable sales, and therefore is entitled to recover VAT on the costs of running that shop, as opposed to the non-business activities of the charity. So where a charity performs its fundamental charitable purpose, um, perhaps for an example, it might be um, the care of children, for which it doesn't make a charge, a charity in that position would not be able to recover VAT 
in relation to the operation of that non-business activity. I, for that activity that it does not make a charge, it has no rights of that recovery. And further, more than that, for those that do have business income, they don't have the right of that recovery where that business income is VAT exempt, and that will be part of our conversation for VAT registered academies later on today. And for that, my imaginary charity in this example, their general overheads will be subject to partial VAT recovery. So they'll be able to recover VAT to the extent of their taxable business activities, but not to the extent of their non-business activities. So that's the norm. That's, the, that's where I'd come from as an ordinary advisor to, to a charity. But let's look at academies, because academies are turn that completely on its head. And the reason um, for this piece of legislation was really to try and replicate the VAT recovery rights that local authorities have and had when they were the ordinary operator of, of schools. Under section 33B of the VAT Act, you can see it's headlined refunds of VAT to academies and specifically talks about refunds where VAT has been incurred on goods and services which are not for the purpose of any business carried on. So complete opposite to what I was just telling you about for an ordinary charity, here we've got a refund mechanism in relation to your non-business activities, essentially your core activities of educating children. That part of the VAT Act goes on to qualify it um, somewhat, to say that in relation to VAT recovery rights, it talks about the proprietor of the academy, so typically the, uh, the head teacher, and it says that those recovery rights which accrue to the proprietor only apply where the proprietor is acting in that capacity, i.e. as the proprietor of the academy. Now that might sound obvious, and you might think, well, what's, in what circumstances wouldn't he or she be acting in that, in that capacity? Well, we've come across one, um, and this is in relation to partnerships. So, in our particular example, one of our academies um, took on the responsibility of being lead school for a group of uh, local academies um, in a behavioural partnership. So the behavioural partnership um, received funding in order to place children appropriately who otherwise might be excluded from, from this ordinary it wasn't completely clear um, what that behavioural partnership, um, how that behavioural partnership existed as an entity. It didn't have its own bank account, for example. So the money just came into our client, into our client academy. Uh, and our client spent that money, including spending it on vatable costs, in relation to running the behavioural partnership. We um, wrote to HMRC to check whether our academy was able to recover VAT in relation to the non-business activities of the behavioural partnership. And the answer we got back was no, they cannot. And the reason they cannot is because where the proprietor of our academy was spending money on the behavior, for the behavioural partnership, he or she was not acting in the capacity of the part of the academy. So it fails this note eight in terms of that recovery. So be careful in terms of that recovery that it's focused on what the academy does and not other things that the academy is just administering for, for some other entity, in this case for a behavioural partnership. Uh, in terms of the limits of Section 33B and in terms of VAT deduction, it specifically excludes the right to VAT recovery in relation to anything that the academy does by way of business. So absolutely the opposite of what I was explaining in relation to an ordinary charity. An academy does, an unregistered academy at least, does have the right to deduct VAT in relation to its non-business activities, but does not, under that section, have the right to VAT recovery in relation to its business activities. Now that will change when we get to a VAT registration position, and I'll explain more about that later, but that's an important distinction, especially for unregistered academies. So just to um, headline that, for an unregistered academy, 
you get VAT recovery on costs relating to your non-business activities, no VAT recovery in relation to your business activities, and partial VAT recovery on your general overheads. And by business activity, we're generally talking about something for which the academy charges. By non-business activities, we're talking about things which the academy does for free at point of use. And for most academies, the vast majority of what you do will be non-business. So in a decision tree, an unregistered academy incurs VAT on purchasing expenses. You um, need to allocate that VAT in three ways. Some of it will relate wholly to your non-business educational activity, and that will be fully recoverable. Some of it will relate to your wholly business activities. Um, and going down the left-hand side of the slide there, you'll see that ends up as not claimable for an unregistered academy. A lot of your costs will actually be used for both. So if you think about um, your school buildings, and your school buildings are used for education, of course, but you also on occasion let out classrooms to, to local users and charge for that, then the school buildings are mixed use. And we go straight down the centre of this slide to a mixed business, non-business use. And we get partial recovery. And our calculation of partial recovery requires some sort of method, some sort of mathematical method in order to, to split it between claimable and non-claimable. And typically what most academies will do in that situation will be to split those mixed vatable costs on the basis of income. So we'd look at our core grant funding income, for example, compare that to our total income, and our total income will include income from lettings, divide one by the other, and we might get a VAT recovery rate very typically in excess of 98% for unregistered academies. So if that's sort of where you are with your calculations, then you're probably in the right area. And if you, you know, to be honest, if you end up one or two percent different from that, um, it's not going to cause a great deal of difference in terms of that recovery. But hopefully, that's that's consistent with what you, um, as academies, see um, in the real world. It's certainly what we see when we are carrying out our audits. And there's an example that's the, so the calculation that I was talking about. Um, where VAT, which cannot be directly attributed to one activity or the other, needs to be subject to this method and the suggested method is income. That standard basis of calculation, um, what we normally suggest is you do that calculation once a year, at year end. So if you get a recovery rate of 98% based on your year end calculation, we suggest that you then apply that same percentage to the next 12 months calculations rather than do a calculation every single month. It's just excessive, really. And then at the year end, recalculate that figure. And if the year end is fallen to 96%, then you make an adjustment for the previous 12 months. Could be up or down. So once a year calculation and apply that percentage to those non-attributable costs as we've just been, uh, as we've just been showing. Key to this is accurate coding. So the starting point, as I was talking about earlier, was that we correctly allocate VAT on costs according to whether they're used wholly for a business activity, not reclaimable by under section 36, wholly to a non-business activity, claimable, or otherwise coded as mixed, and then subject to, to um, that calculation. Like a um, VAT registered academy, unregistered academies are potentially subject to HMRC review. So HMRC could come to an unregistered academy at any time and say, okay, you're putting all these claims in on your 128. Um, we want to see justification for them. We want to see invoices, we want to see calculations, um, etc. Um, 
my honest answer to that is I haven't seen that happen in the five years I've been at um, MHA. Seen it happen with registered academies quite often, about registered academies. I haven't seen an unregistered academy subject to, to an HMRC intervention. And, and, and it, strangely, um, we did have an academy which had quite innocently overclaimed VAT. This was an unregistered academy. I don't know whether, I can't remember what the circumstances were. They may have made a, a double entry um, error. We wrote to HMRC and said, oh, we've overclaimed uh, this VAT. Uh, what do you want us to do about it? And their answer was, well, we HMRC can't really find a mechanism to claw that back from you. So that was interesting. So unlike when you're that registered, HMRC have loads of powers in terms of assessments and interest and penalties. They don't seem convinced that they have those same powers in relation to unregistered academies. I mean, happily, you know, we're, we're, we're in a position where um, all of you are trying to get things right all the time. Um, my experience of people in academies is they are far more diligent and accurate than most of my business clients. <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a fair comment. And just because HMRC may have limited powers, don't change your attitude to that, please. In order to make a claim then, if you're not VAT registered, you'll usually make, fill in com complete a form 126. Um, usually people do that monthly, just keep cash flow going. It doesn't have to be monthly, but it must be at least a month and it must run to a month end. Um, and you can claim costs up to four years after they're incurred. But of course, we don't, we don't leave it that long. So I've been speaking quite a lot about the split between business and non-business. So I think I need to just um, focus now a little bit more about what I mean by business, because it's so important in terms of not being able to recover VAT on the related costs for an unregistered academy. Fairly simple test here. If you charge, it's probably business. Now I'm going to I'm going to change that a little bit in a moment in terms of a closely related supplies to education. But generally, if you make a charge, you need to think about whether it's business. So it might, and I'll give you a, um, a list of some business activities in a moment. In terms of non-business income, when I talked about that calculation between uh, that, that recovery calculation. Examples of non-business income on this slide, core funding is going to be the biggest one. You might also be lucky enough to get donations from parents, gifts, etc. All of that contributes and funds your non-business activities. And I'd be comfortable putting all of that on the top line of that equation. But also you'll note I'm adding there things that are charged for, but are closely related to the education you provide. And in certain circumstances, they are also classed as non-business. So what do we mean by closely related? We mean things that are absolutely necessary for delivery of education, directly related to the delivery of education. And whilst there may be a charge made to uh, students and their parents, that charge is no more than cost. So you're not seeking to make any surplus on that. You're just trying to recover the costs of that essential equipment and services that you need to spend to deliver education. Um, interesting ones here. Catering, yes, non-business when charged, including if you're charging duty staff, but not if you're charging other staff. So staff, if staff members choose to use the school canteen, and a charge for using the school canteen, then that is a business activity because it's not closely related. It's not necessary for delivery of education. But catering for duty staff and catering for children is closely related. You'll see that um, some of the tools of the classroom uh, are listed here. So if you make charges for calculators, stationery, um, rulers, that sort of thing, that can all be classed as non-business income, even though you've made a charge for it. I've put tablets on there, um, laptops, that sort of thing, because my assumption was 
that everybody would accept that they are necessary tools and essential. And therefore, if you were charging parents for them at or below cost, that HMRC would accept that they are closely related and therefore non-business. However, we found some guidance in relation to local authorities, which says the opposite. And that guidance says that the charge for laptops is not considered essential to education. It's not a closely related item and therefore would fall to be a business supply. So to be a business supply, you would be, would be prevented as an unregistered academy from reclaiming VAT on the cost. And furthermore, you would treat the value as part of your vatable turnover. So it would count towards your turnover threshold. And if you were that registered, it would become a vatable sale. Very, very strange. Um, that guidance, I think, was probably written 10 or more years ago. That guidance did not change despite COVID. Um, and during COVID, um, use of technology clearly became absolutely essential to the delivery of education. So we're pretty sure that guidance is wrong. We have, through the um, ATT, which is an accounting um, professional body, we have raised this with HMRC saying this, this is surely wrong and surely your policy has changed on that. We haven't yet got a response. Um, my absolute feeling on that is that laptops are essential. And if you're charging at a below cost, you should treat that as non-business. But bear in mind there is some risk there because that contradicts what HMRC publicly say in relation to local authority schools. Um, breakfast and after school clubs, which you might make a charge for. Again, yes, essential to education. Yes, closely related. And yes, non-business. Um, we might get a different answer in relation to summer, summer camps. Um, there's been a couple of cases in relation to summer camps. Um, one was called Planet Sport and one, if I recall, was called RSR. Planet Sport was a summer camp um, focusing on sport. So teaching of sporting skills, joining in games, etc. And the tribunal felt that that was not closely related um, because it didn't focus on, um, or rather the, the tribunal actually found that it wasn't VAT exempt. That was the key here. It was business, but it wasn't VAT exempt because the focus of Planet Sport was not the care of children. So for a summer school, um, you will be making a charge and it will be business. But if you can show that care of the child is at the centre of that, then it will be VAT exempt. So the, the knock on of that is no VAT recovery on costs if you're unregistered, but the income does not count towards your turnover threshold for VAT registration purposes. So the difference there between a sports based summer school and a care based summer school. One is vatable and one is VAT exempt. Okay, not usually classed as closely related. And bear in mind, if these are not classed as closely related, the income from it is treated as business income. You do not get the right VAT recovery in relation to the costs of these activities. And some of them will count towards your VAT registration threshold turnover. Um, the operation of a, a children's nursery is an important one to mention because if you're charging for attendance at a nursery, that is a business activity. It's a VAT exempt business activity if you are state, you know, that required to be state regulated. So it won't count towards your VAT registration threshold, but you cannot recover VAT in relation to the costs of running that. So in relation to our clients, those with nurseries, those unregistered academies are also in nurseries, they suffer a larger percentage of disallowance of VAT than our other clients. So watch out for that. Um, yeah, goods not needed for regular use in the class. That's where that laptop conversation came in. Tuck shops are not classed as closely related. Um, school prom tickets are not classed as closely related because they're not essential to education. So they would count um, as business, no VAT recovery on costs, 
um, and potentially vatable, I count towards your turnover threshold um, when uh, and liable to VAT if you're actually VAT registered. Um, supplies of staff, generally um, a business supply. There is an exclusion to that, which I may come onto in another slide. If not, I'll certainly mention it. And so all the, take all these things into account when you're doing your calculation and understand which ones are vatable. So tuck shops, for example, vatable, school palm tickets, vatable, um, physical goods provided at or above cost price, vatable. They all count towards our £85,000 VAT registration threshold. Lynn, um, yes. Bianca, can I just ask um, one question that's been posed? Um, and it might have been on your previous slide. Is that did you mention school trips and the VAT position on school trips? Yes, yeah, so school trips do count as closely related to education. And therefore, provided they're charged at or below cost, that income is treated as non-business. The unregistered account. Sorry. Yes. And so, and so, if a school um, in their charge to the parents, they have to obviously, let's say, hire a coach. Um, so they take that cost into the um, calculation of the cost um, that they then charge on to the parent. Yes, yeah, so a hire coach. Um, tickets for entry and I think provide you um, a reasonable about the way in which you calculate cost um, then HMRC are not going to challenge you and say oh, you, you, you seem to have made a profit here um, if you aim to make a profit you, you specifically go out and say oh school trips are a good way of raising extra funds then it couldn't be closely related you would fail that non-business test but that's not my experience of schools and that's not what schools do thank you Thank you. Yeah, so I was going to mention staff. I, I know I've got a slide about this. So ordinarily a supply of staff to some other organisation would be liable to VAT. It would be business and it would be liable to VAT. However, where you second staff, maybe a teacher, maybe a head teacher, um, and that staff has been working in the non-business activities of your academy, as a teacher, for example, and also will be working in the non-business activities of the place that you second them to, maybe as a teacher in another academy, and providing that you charge no more than what you have to pay that member of staff, um, then that can be treated as non-business. So that's an exception to what we'd normally expect with supplies of staff, which would be vatable and business. So comments of non-business staff, including teaching staff to teach in other locations, non-business, non-vatable, doesn't cause a problem for our VAT recovery rights. So, sort of distinguish there between business and non-business activities. Within business now, we need to be, make sure we understand the difference between things that are vatable because they count towards your £85,000 threshold and things which are exempt, which do not count towards the threshold. Under the health and welfare heading, um, that's where exemption applies for uh, nurseries because that comes to the care and protection of young children, which when provided by a charity or provided by a state regulated organisation is VAT exempt. Business but doesn't count towards the threshold. Certain sporting supplies are exempt, um, but I'm going to talk more about that because that's quite niche. The rental of land is VAT exempt. So if you rent out classrooms, um, that's exempt. It is business, but doesn't count towards that £85,000 threshold. Outside of those headings, most of what you would charge for that is business would be vatable and would count towards the £85,000 threshold. Um, some exceptions to the land exemption, sport and parking. Parking's an easy one. If you charge anybody to park in your school, that is vatable income. It counts towards your 85,000 threshold. Once you're VAT registered, you need to account for VAT on it. Sport's a bit more complicated, so I'm going to deal more with that. 
I think this will be familiar to lots of you, um, but it still does cause quite a lot of questions and quite a lot of challenges actually from, from users of, of, of um, school facilities. The letting of land for sport or recreation, such as on a dance, for example, um, is vatable. It counts towards your 85,000 threshold. If you are that you need to account for VAT on that income, except for these two things on this slide. One is, and this is unusual, we don't see this very often in academies, if you were to let, um, I don't know, a 3G pitch or something for a whole weekend, so in a period exceeding 24 hours, that by default is VAT exempt, doesn't count towards the threshold. More common is this idea, if, if you enter into a series of lets with a user of the type described and underlined there, subject the, to the conditions on this slide, those series of lets can be VAT exempt. So that overrides the standard rating, it becomes VAT exempt. You'll note, however, that is limited in terms of who can qualify for that exemption. It's only exempt if the hirer is another school, a club, an association, or a local league. That exemption does not apply, cannot apply, to 10 or more lets if the person who hires it is some sort of commercial user. Um, the most common example I've come across recently is um, swimming instructors. So a swimming instructor might come along and say, well, you've got a pool. Um, I've got a business teaching children how to swim. I'd like to hire your pool once a week. Um, and I'll enter into a longer term agreement to say, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent it for the whole term. Same time every week. I'm willing to pay for it in advance. Or commit to pay for it in advance, at least. Those type of hirers do not qualify for this exemption. No matter what they argue, and they do argue, because they're not a school, club, association, or local league. And therefore, that income is vatable. Um, counts towards your threshold is the main thing for you, for those who are unregistered. For those who are registered, then we need to think about how we account for VAT on it. This is another risk area that we've come across. Sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, one, one question that's been posed just before you move off from that. Um, a question about, does the exclusive use only, only apply to the series of let's condition or also to the continuous period condition? Uh, both. So the continuous period condition, it must be, I've come along, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hire the uh, 3G pitch and it's only for me for more than 24 hours. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. This is um, this particular situation that we've come across as a risk. Um, and imagine a school that's got a decent piece of land, would really like a 3G, 4G pitch. Uh, built on that land, perhaps doesn't have the funds to do so. So somebody else comes along, and it might be um, the local authority, it might be a local sports club, and they say, look, we've got some money, we'll, we'll build this 3G pitch for you, and in return, we want to use it so we'll let, the academy can use it it's on your land, you'll be able to use it, of course. But we, the, piece, the person who's paid for it to be built, we also want to use it. And we'll agree with the academy what hours we can use it as opposed to when the academy can use it. That is classic barter. That is an agreement under which one person does something for another in return for something else. No cash changes hands. And because no cash changes hands, VAT sometimes gets forgotten. And then we could be into all sorts of difficulties. Because what needs to happen in this example is that both the academy and the um, sports club partner in my example need to put a value 
on those bartered services. So the construction work might be worth a million pound. And if the partner is there willing to spend that money in return for shared use, then the value of the shared use is also a million pound. Because if no cash changes hand, that must be the value the price has put to it. The construction work carried out by that sports partner is vatable. They should raise an invoice to the academy plus VAT for that work. And then the academy needs to consider what the VAT treatment of the shared use is. And to consider the VAT treatment of the shared use, we would need to go back to our previous slide and say, well, does, it, does that shared use meet these conditions, any of these conditions, in which case the shared use charge might be VAT exempt. And then we've got a mismatch between VATable construction work and exempt charge for use. Now, if we identify this before it happens, then we can deal with it. Fair. We can usually deal with it because we can say, actually, there's ways in which we can make sure the academy charges charge for shared use is VATable. We can then ensure the academy gets full VAT recovery on the construction work invoice. Post event, if this has been done without um, taking advice, well, it takes a bit of unpicking. I mean, apart from anything else, this could e very easily and immediately tip an academy that's unregistered into being liable to be VAT registered. So watch out for those sort of transactions where you agree to do something for somebody in return for them being something for you. No cash changes hands and therefore nobody thinks about VAT. Now there's another exemption for sports, which um, is sometimes raised by um, by users of academies facilities as being an alternative um, to the to the series of let's exemption that we talked about and that is services closely were linked to uh, sport provided by an eligible body an eligible body being a not-for-profit making body so academies would fit into that criteria um, but then subject to a ring fencing condition and the ring fencing condition is that any surplus is made from the letting of that sports facilities to an individual must be ring fenced and used for the further improvement of sporting facilities or for the purposes of another a different non-profit making body so if you let out sporting facilities to an individual swimming teacher in my example and you use those funds just in the general funds of the academy then you don't meet the test of this exemption because you've not ring fenced I've dealt with that one, so that was about holiday clubs. Now let's move on a little bit to um, towards VAT registration. So I've already talked about all academies having the right to deduct VAT on costs relating to their non-business activities. But in addition, if an academy is registered for VAT, it also gains the right to recover VAT on costs relating to its taxable activities. And by tax bar things mean things at the zero reduced and 20% rate. A, a VAT registered academy still has a VAT recovery problem, however, because it will make some exempt supplies. Exempt supplies do not bear the right of VAT recovery. So we get to a more complex and detailed calculation about VAT recovery once you're VAT registered. So why do academies register for VAT? The most common reason for registering for VAT is in the context of multi-academy trusts where the value of their vatable supplies exceeds the threshold of 85,000. So as you grow, as you move into, an, into a mat and bring in turnover from all those different academies, you need to carefully monitor what, what income of yours is taxable. You monitor that at the end of every month, looking back 12 months, and as soon as it's gone over 85,000, you must register within a month. So that's something for unregistered academies to keep a careful eye on. You might also choose to register for that voluntarily, um, particularly if you've got um, expenditure, for example, on um, sporting costs like our pitch, where you intend to make business supplies in the future, maybe haven't done yet because you've not completed it, but want to put yourself in a position to recover VAT now. So sometimes voluntary registration early is worth doing. 
So additional VAT recovery applies if you're VAT registered because you can now start to recover VAT in relation to your business taxable activities as well as your non-business activities. Disadvantages of VAT registration, there's more compliance obligations. Those obligations are much more stringently um, applied by HMRC. You're allowed to get VAT visits. You need to keep proper VAT returns. There are penalties when you get things wrong. And very important to mention making VAT digital. Making VAT digital requires you to submit VAT returns digitally, so electronically, directly to HMRC. It's not, it's not a paper form. You can't fill it in manually on the computer. It has to be transmitted to HMRC. And in addition, your records, once you're VAT registered, must have digital links. So that means that the data in your software, in your accounting software, must flow through from the point of entry all the way through to the VAT return and to VAT return submission without further intervention. So you can't, you're not supposed to take data from one system and then retype it, for example. That, that absolutely isn't allowed. The data enters the system, flows through the system, through the ledgers, ends up in the VAT return, the VAT, press a button, the VAT return gets submitted. That's what making tax digital is all about. Um, you may use spreadsheets as part of that system. Um, but if you do use spreadsheets, what you cannot do and must not do is cut and paste. Cut and, and you must not retype and you must not cut and paste. If you're using spreadsheets, cells must be digitally linked to the source data. And you'll see from this that there are penalties for failing to apply those rules, including a daily penalty for failing to have digital links. This is quite new. This is published at the end of May. Um, and the also the other thing HMRC has said is you must use checking functions within your software. So if your software allows you to check the accuracy of your VAT calculations, HMRC say you must use those functions, you must evidence that you've used them. So management reporting, for example. Right. Um, partial exemption. I'm not sure whether I've got a slide further on about sport, but I do want to, I just want to talk a bit more about sport. In fact, let's go back to this slide. These are the conditions under which you can, can or must, I should say, exempt your supplies. But what do we know about exemption? We know that exemption is business. So fundamentally, we get no VAT recovery. But furthermore, we know it's not taxable business. So even if we're VAT registered, we don't get VAT recovery. Now that's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem because we might have a very large amount of capital expenditure in relation to construction of something like a new pitch. You know, it could be over a million pounds. So then to say, actually that VAT on that million pound, 200,000 pound of VAT, can only be recovered to the extent of school use and can't be recovered to the extent of exempt lettings, well, that's a bitter pill to swallow. So it may be, on, on this example, we may find that we've got a big chunk of VAT on this barter transaction, which suddenly the academy finds that, to a significant extent, it can't recover because it intends to let them out in these series of lets or for periods exceeding 24 hours. So it may suit the academy to try and ensure that all lettings of, of sporting facilities that have been built like that are vatable. And there's two ways you can do that. One is that you can refuse to enter in series of lets of 10 or more. You could limit series of lets to nine or less. Um, you could make sure that you never let for a period exceeding 24 hours, in which case you, you know, you've, you've broken the exemption naturally or you may just decide to do something called opt-in to tax so opt-in to tax um, you write to hmrc you set out a plan you say here's my sports land um, you may do more than that you may do the whole school and you commit that when you charge rent on the area specified that that rent will be liable to vat and that overrides this exemption on this slide it makes everything vatable it's a commitment for 20 years. Um, it would affect anything you did with that land in terms of letting or selling it. Um, but it does create the conditions under which you as an academy can get much greater VAT recovery, possible full VAT recovery 
on a very expensive capital item. So the downside of the users having to pay more in terms of higher is very often offset by that excellent VAT recovery on high capital outlay at the outset, if that makes sense. So again, that's a thought process you need to do with any major capital expenditure. Think about, well, how am I going to use this? Is it just for school use and non-business and therefore I haven't got a problem? Or am I also going to let this to local users, whether it be a theatre or a pitch or classroom, new classrooms? Am I also going to let it to local users? And if I am, should I make a decision on opting to tax, which puts the academy in a much better VAT recovery position? So all that is about planning ahead, thinking ahead. Um, time's getting away with us, getting away from us, of course. And um, I want to just one other thing I want to mention. Sorry, Lynn, Lynn, yeah, Lynn, sorry yeah. to interrupt again. You've got the slide up. Can I just ask um, a question that on the slide that you've got up? With the continuous period exceeding twenty-four hours, is it? Um, is that a separate condition from the series of, of lets or does it mean so it's got to be 24 hours and 10 or more for exclusive use of etc or are they or or are they um, different rules they're different and discreet different and discreet okay yeah. thank you so very much either would apply okay thank you um, yeah I just want to mention training income um, which um, I meant to mention this earlier. So training, training of NQTs, for example, you may get grant income for, and that becomes non-business. Or you may be paid to train NQTs. I, on an individual basis, you, you, you said, by um, a local university, for example, they may say, will you train this NQT? We'll pay you per head. Now, if, you, if you're paid per head, you're much more likely to be VAT exempt and business, which gives us a VAT recovery issue. The other thing to watch out for in training is you may um, be a receiver of grant funding on behalf of many academies in your area as a lead school. And you may even keep all of that money because you then actually carry out the training for teachers from those other partner schools. Now, because it came in as a grant in the first place, you might attempt to think, well, it's a grant, it's outside the scope, I don't need to worry about business. But if the conditions are that it's a grant that belongs to others, and those others then let you retain it because you're providing a service to them, then it becomes exempt. And if it becomes exempt, it becomes business, and that's a completely different effect on your VAT recovery calculations. There's another risk there just to watch out for, because that's one we've come across recently as well. Right. A um, few more minutes, too, that we've got in... I was talk, start talking about VAT and it always uh, <laughs> always get carried away, so apologies for that. This is a decision tree for a VAT registered um, academy. A bit more complex than our earlier one. Although we start with the same principles that we allocate costs to holding on business on the right hand side where it's claimable. Um, to holy business on the left hand side. Now let's just follow that down a little bit further. Where we've got costs relating to a business activity we then need to allocate that between when that business activity is exempt, for example, um, nursery education, in which case we do not generally get that recovery, or taxable. For example, uh, we've opted to tax now sports lettings or vatable, in which case the VAT is reclaimable down the left-hand side of the slide. In the centre of the slide, we've got the same issue that we've got for unregistered academies, that a lot of our costs will be mixed, we need to split that as those, the VAT on those mixed costs, again, in the same way as for unregistered academies between business and non-business, with the non-business proportion being claimable. For the business proportion, we've then got a further calculation to do because we've got use for business purposes, it just might be both taxable and exempt. So we've got a further calculation called past exemption method to determine how much of that business VAT can be claimed. So couple of different layers there. Um, the other thing that we've seen go wrong um, is the treatment of fuel and power. So look out for fuel and power bills because fuel and power is at a reduced rate of 5% and if this process is 20% then you end up over recovery.
unlike uh, the business non-business split where the, you've got some flexibility in the method that you use for calculation, once you're VAT registered and you get into the partial exemption calculation, there is something called a standard method. Now the standard method is the default method you must use unless you get agreement from HMRC. Happily, the standard method is based on income. So we'll have two income-based calculations in effect. Our first income-based calculation splits between business and non-business, my 98% recovery in my earlier example. And our partial exemption method just looks at business income and says what percentage of that business income is taxable, what percentage is exempt, that's our split of that part of the decision tree. So although the decision tree looks complicated, actually break it down into its component elements, not too bad. And we can help with that um, if you need help devising the method, working out how it communicates through to the VAT return. Some VAT registered academies are in the happy position that notwithstanding that they've got some VAT exempt business activities, they get full VAT recovery. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail. I'll just mention that for those of you who think, oh, hang on, I do recover VAT in full. Um, why is that? There's this thing called de minimis. And de minimis basically says, well, if having done that decision tree calculation, the VAT that you allocate to your exempt activities is very small, and here's, the, here's what we mean by small, then you can still claim it. So that may explain why you get full VAT recovery. Other than that, if you're getting full VAT recovery, either as an unregistered or registered academy, you need to have a good look at it and think, why is that? Am I doing everything I should be doing? Skip through these. Um, I mentioned again about big capital projects. There are some reliefs available for charities um, constructing a new build property. So the, the reliefs don't apply if you're constructing an extension. But for a new build standalone property that's not an annex or an extension or an alteration, there's the potential for zero rating. So the builder wouldn't charge you VAT, subject to you giving the builder a certificate that says we are a charity and we intend to use this new building solely for non-business purposes. You may wish to do that, um, but there are some dangers in giving that certificate because by solely we mean generally thought of as 95% or more. And it sort of limits your ability in the way that you use that new building or that new capital item um, because it limits your, the ability for you to let it out. Because if you commit to saying this is solely non-business, solely school use, and then two or three years down the line, you think, you know what, we can make some money from this property. We could start to let it out to local people who are interested. Well, you may find then that you have to repay some of the VAT that you saved on the zero rating. So actually, sometimes it might be better on a new build, and we've even had this on a complete new build school. So the school was demolished, built at the other, the other side of the, um, of the land plot, and potentially could have been zero rated. But our advice to that particular kind of mutual, don't issue the certificate. Pay VAT to the builder, claim it back according to your method, because then you, you're not bound to always use it for non-business purposes. You've got flexibility in future use to let out to the local community uh, as and when. So then again, I suppose the, the, the overriding message for that is for any major capital project, take advice. One final thing I want to say, um, Bianca, before we, we run out of time, is in relation to large capital projects, there are further adjustments that are required. So where you incur VAT on a cost that exceeds £250,000, we get our initial VAT recovery in the way we've been describing through our decision trees. That initial recovery is then subject to adjustment over 10 years. That's called the capital goods scheme. So if you have any assets like that, where you spend more than £250,000 plus VAT on it, you need to be applying capital goods scheme adjustments to it once a year. Again, we can help with that. Do seek advice. So I'm just about run out of time, unfortunately. Um, Bianca, is there any more questions that we should tackle now? Yes, um, we have a number of questions. Um, so um, I will try and group them together. There's, I think, five questions at the moment. Um, so the first couple are to do with um, supply of staff. 
So it's the VAT treatment for the supply of staff that are not a secondment, but on a service level agreement to other schools. Yes, didn't have to, wouldn't have to be a secondment. Um, I think secondment was an example. Providing that, that those staff members were engaged in the non-business activities of the lending academy and will be involved in the non-business activities of the borrowing academy, that would be non-business outside the scope of VAT. Okay, thank you. Um, and the another um, staff related one is about um, from a, a MAT that's registered for VAT. They have a team of PE specialists that provide PE and school sports services to other academies. Should they be charging VAT on this supply of staff? Or so the services, they, the sports services to other academies? Okay, so it, it would be a supply of staff if they came under the direction and control of the borrowing academy. Um, and therefore subject to the rules we've just been discussing. If they don't come under the direction and control of the borrowing academy, so we just go in to provide sports lessons, then that would be business but VAT exempt. So VAT exempt because it's education and we're, and we're an eligible body. But it's not education funded directly by grants, it's education funded by payment. Okay, um, thank you. Um, there was a question about um, capital funding of projects in excess of 250,000 um, through you know, SIF monies, condition improvement funding. Um, is, is the position different because it's being um, funded via condition improvement funding? I, sus I, I expect the answer to be no, it's not. It's, it's about the value you're going to spend on the projects, isn't it? Not how the cost is being met. You're absolutely right, Bianchi. It doesn't matter where the money came from. It's does it does the cost that you're incurring in the construction exceed 250,000? Yes or no? And then in terms of that recovery, it depends on how you're going to use uh, the, the the building or the or, or the capital item that you're creating. Then there was a question about um, the you know VAT recovery um, because in your example you mentioned that typically um, an academy trust might be able to recover you know. 98% or whatever when they've done the calculation. Mm -hmm. So there was a question that said, um, if you're going to, um, you know, why wouldn't you claim all the input VAT if you are um, incurring all the costs regardless of letting? But I, I suppose I'm not a VAT person, but I assume it's the 98% the is because you're using that facility, whatever it is, classroom or whatever, Yes, you're using it, but you're also, if you're letting it out, you've got to restrict your input fat recovery. Yeah, yeah, I can see the logic of the question. I think the question is saying, well, I would have spent this money anyway, you know, Yes. because I'm, I'm an academy and I need to spend this money. Um, but unfortunately, if you do, if you do make exempt lettings uh, or, or business lettings, then them's the rules. You, you just, yeah. you just end up with a restriction. Yeah. Um, then there's a, a, a question about, um, laptop schemes um, so if a laptops are um, provided um, by the school yeah. um, the school has got um, a, a, a lease and they give the laptops to the to the children but the parents actually pay um, via a learning scheme to a third party um, and the third party then transfers this income to the school and the school uses that income to pay for leasing of their laptops. So can the school claim the VAT on those operating lease payments? And this goes, this goes to this example I was given that we found in the local authority guidance which specifically said that laptops are not closely related and therefore you couldn't get that recovery uh, as an unregistered academy because it's not treated as non-business. Um, and if you're a registered academy, I suppose they'd say, well, you could record the VAT, but you'd have to account for VAT on the income. Now, all of that to me sounds wrong. 
that that guidance to local authorities being old and pre-COVID just doesn't make any sense. The, the, the laptop schemes, it seems to me self-evident that they are closely related. And in this example, you've given me, I think we're saying the school isn't making a profit out of, out of, the, uh, of the scheme. Um, so my view is that that should be treated as non-business and the school should get that recovery on the costs. But you've just got to bear in mind that that's my view and not HMRC's published view, which we're trying to um, winkle out of HMRC through the ATT. Mm. Yes, thank you. And then a few more questions. Um, is that one school has got um, a hall or theatre. They're not, they're not that registered, um, but they're going to buy some more equipment um, for use in this hall or theatre, whatever it may be. Um, but that theatre or hall is rented out sometimes to third parties. And presumably that means when they're going to buy the equipment for that particular theatre or hall, do they only, can they only partially recover the VAT on those purchases of equipment? Yes, that's right. As an unregistered academy, they've got some business use of that equipment, which they need to recognise in that decision tree calculation. Now that calculation, I, I know I spoke at a high level of saying, well, it's 98% because that's sort of split of income. Um, it may be that you might think, well, actually 98% is excessive in that example because maybe we ought to be a little bit more forensic and say, how is that equipment going to be used? Um, perhaps it's used 75% of the time by the school and 25% of the time by people who are hiring the theatre. So you might do a more nuanced calculation, but the principle is there must be partial restriction if you're unregistered. Thank you. And if um, uh, an academy trust um, has a breakfast club, um, the question was, is it the income, the turnover that's used in deciding whether the threshold is going to be met or the profit? Because obviously they, they make a charge, they incur some costs, so they make a little bit of money. Yes, yeah, so I think I said um, breakfast clubs were closely related. Yes, if I think if it's if it's to their own children, you know, they're coming. Yeah, if it's to their own children, yeah. then it doesn't count towards any sort of threshold. Um, it's classed as non-business, even though there's some income accruing to it. So happy days all round, really. We get that recovery and we don't need to count it towards the threshold. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have got some more questions still, but I think what we will do is um, we'll respond directly to those that we've, um, probably won't have time to answer because I know we, we have overrun now. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for attending. Um, we will follow up the outstanding questions after the webinar. And um, for those of you that registered for the Academy Trust Handbook session, um, obviously you, you are aware that it hasn't yet been released for the 1st of um, September 22. We're not aware of when it will be released. Um, there was, uh, the SFA made a comment um, yesterday that it does need ministerial sign off. So that might not be imminent yet. Um, so we will rearrange the webinar on the Academy Trust Handbook um, when, when it is released. Um, but just for everybody to be aware that if it's released sometime in September, for example, you still have to follow the rules of the existing handbook that's in place at the moment until such time as the new one is released. So just just be aware of that. And we will let you um, know as soon as we, we know um, when when the handbook is released and we can organise another webinar. So I'd like to thank you all very much. Thank you, Galyn, for a very enlightening webinar. Um, VAT is always complicated um, and I think we'll all go back and refer to your slides many, many times. So, so thank you very much, everybody. And have a good summer if we don't have another webinar in the next week or so.